Yeah, look, I think it's a blind spot for many business leaders, right? So particularly in a large organization, if you've got a, you know, a thousand employees or, or more, how do you know, how do you really know how customer centric you're operating as, as a business? And there are blind spots in there that you want to uncover. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Growth and Scaling Podcast. Today, we are so pleased to have with us a doctor. That's right. Dr. Chris Brown is here with us today. Will you please tell us who you are and what you do? Hey, Todd. It's great to be here. Um, thanks so much. So uh, my, my background essentially has been as a management consultant. So I've been working with senior leadership teams for many years, helping them shape awesome. their organizational culture. Um, so, so that's kind of been the focus of, of the work that we do uh, at Market love Culture. It. And yeah, I'm excited to be here. So thanks. Now, I love guys like you because you see, you see a lot of things that most business people don't see, which is from the outside looking in, what's not aligning your teams? So tell us, tell us some things that you see. I mean, who's your ideal client? What kind of companies do you work with? Is there an industry you work with? Or yeah. give us an idea of your, your avatar. Yeah, so I mean, we've been working with a, a range of industries across the globe. Our largest client's been Vodafone globally, so telecommunications cool. firm, um, right. as well as you know companies that are that are insurance based that typically aren't very good at customer centricity, right? So they're they're known to be not so customer centric, and we try to help them change that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that that is a problem with the certain industries, isn't it? Mm, mm, I think we've all had those experiences. <laughs> So, so what do you do? I mean, you go in and you and you do what with them? Do you, so, are these companies? What are the big pain points you're solving? Yeah, look. So, so this concept of customer centricity is a pretty vague term, isn't it? And everyone's got a different perspective on what that might be. So, the first thing we do right. is, is we've we've got an assessment tool that we that we developed uh, in a rigorous way to try and understand what what actually is customer centricity. What are the behaviors? What are the consistent right. things that companies exhibit? that ultimately result in great customer experiences. Uh, and so we use sure. that assessment tool as, a, as an initial deployment across them so that they can get an understanding of really how customer centric are we versus the best companies in the world. People like Amazon and Apple and these companies that we all know right. uh, are, are really good. Uh, and that's a, that's a, it's a little bit like jumping on the scale, right? And saying, we're, you know, how, how heavy are we and how are we gonna now right. lose some weight, right? You know, it, it is hard to know where you're at unless you do some kind of assessment. Mm. What, what kind of things do you do in the assessment? I mean, who should be thinking, if those listening, mm. who should be saying, ah, crap, I need to do one of those? Like, how do you make the people yeah. understand that this is something they should be thinking about? Yeah, look, I think it's a blind spot for many business leaders, right? So particularly yeah. in a large organization, if you've got, a, you know, a thousand employees or, or more, how do you know, yeah. how do you really know how customer centric you're operating as as a business and there are blind spots in there that you want to uncover and so the assessment allows you to deploy that across your employees and they'll tell you where they think they're doing really great work when it comes to customer experience and where they're not and and these are blind spots right. that the ceo typically doesn't have um right and so right, there's, right. there's a lot of new information that they would get that they wouldn't otherwise right because it gets filtered through layers of leadership and and that sort of thing sure so assessment and then what what, so, what do you do to help them? Yeah, so the next piece of that then is the you know, first part's discovery. So, you know, where are we right now? And then it's a matter of, you know, right. fundamentally it's a, a leadership challenge, right? So leaders that want customer-centric organizations need to sort of role model customer centricity. So they really need yeah. to they need to be the ones that are out talking to customers. They need to demonstrate to others in the organization how important customers are to the business. And if they're right. not doing that, then, you know, we need to help them sort of develop some of those skills because sometimes, you know, it's a, a bit of a skill set and, and, and overcome some of their own inhibitors to maybe doing that. Maybe they've got a finance right. background or a technical background and they're not suited to maybe going out and doing that. The people but, person. Yeah, right. that's right. So help them develop some of those things because certainly all, all people um, can develop some of these skills um, over sure. time. So, sure. you know, it's about it's about role modeling, leadership, and also ensuring that the mechanisms are in place in the business so that people are awarded right. for customer centricity. So they're, you know, they're the people that you hold up in the business. I love it. I love it. No, that's fascinating because it, it truly is one of those things that a lot of people don't think about 
And a lot of, uh, you know, I've had a few people on this show who are CX experienced masters who come in and say, look, really? Your customer service should be like your largest profit center of the business, right? Yeah. Or a big yeah. revenue center. Yeah. How do you help them develop those kind of awarenesses to their to yeah. their customer centricity? Yeah, look, I think what happens is over time, you know, as these businesses scale, we're talking about scaling today. One of the challenges right. is, you know, that the, the, um, people become internally focused, right? They become more right. focused on tasks, processes, things like that. And what we want them right. to do is start to think like a customer again. So let's get yeah. them exposed to customers. What's it like to, yeah. to actually deal with your organization? Um, <laughs> you know, how does it feel to be a customer? Try and put them yeah. in the customer's shoes again. And so some, some customer mindset activity, we'd call that. And, you know, the best part, the best thing to do is we've all had customer experiences. Just think about one that you yeah. really hated. What what happened? Try and diagnose why that why was that an experience you hated? What was it about sure. that? Uh, and now think about your own business. Are we doing that to our customers too? Right. So let's let's <laughs> totally. not do that. Let's not do that. Yeah. What does that look like? I mean, is it is it very often that they see that holy crap, I wouldn't want to buy for myself, or is it <laughs> is it generally a mixed bag? Yeah. Look, it's a mix. It's a mix. I mean. Most most companies they're they're not trying to 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 create bad customer experiences, right? But these things happen, and so right. I think it's lifting the veil a little bit and and giving them some new perspective and 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 so on. It's not always easy to to get to gain that, right? You need some right. external input to be able to gain that, and you need to 100%. step away from the business to 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 kind of reflect on what are we doing. Uh, and if you yeah. don't, if you're just operating at a hundred miles an hour, then you you kind of you don't see it. So uh, there's, there's a little bit involved there. Hundred percent. No, it totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. So, so now we know what your business does, and we know who you like to help. Yep. Tell us a little bit about your business. I mean, yep. how does market culture operate? Are you international? Have you, yep. you know, tell us about the growth journey. I mean, where have you come, and where did you start, and where did you come from on your own? Yeah. So, so. We started our offices in in California back in two thousand and four, so you can probably nice. tell. Yeah, you know, I've got the Australian accent. I'm from Sydney originally, um, but we started right. in San Francisco, uh, and originally we we're just a management consulting firm. So we we're taking on you know single clients at a time or two clients at a time, and they're pretty sure. you know, involved engagements. And over time, one yeah. of the things yeah. that we did to to scale was we actually made a lot of our tools and methodologies available to consulting partners. So, Interesting. So we accredit. Um, uh, we've got more than 120 partners around the world now that actually cool. can use some of our assessment tools to help yeah. their clients and help their uh, their clients actually improve their customer centricity. So that's Very been cool. that's been a sort of primary way that we've scaled is through accreditation yeah. in our tools. And then the second way that we've been working on the last year or so is then taking the tools a step further to where they're becoming more self service, almost like a software as a service. So that um, our partners can use those with their clients, and our clients can some some of our direct clients can come and use those themselves also. Um, so we're building cool. more, more of that. So 120 uh, partners that you've got signed up as accredited partners so far, and and where do you see this going? I mean, how how many partners do you want to take on? Is yeah. it something that as they as they you get accredited with your tools? Are they then applying the principles or are you then doing any part of that on the backside? Yeah, so our role then is just on the assessment piece. So we, we just help, gotcha. help on that and that's where we're investing our technology. The you cool. know, the partners, in terms of the partners we've got, it's like any any sort of group of partners. It's the 80-20 rule, right, where we've got sort of yeah. 20% of those partners that are super active and they're really engaged and doing a lot of things. And some of those sure. might, might do one or two a year. Um, yeah, you know, I think that there's a lot more scale opportunity for us um, in terms of yeah. the use of the tool, and 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 that's what we're really focused on the next sort of twelve months or so. Running a business honestly can leave a lot of founders and operators feeling lonely and isolated. If you have ever felt that way, trust me, I know what it feels like, and there is something you can do about it. You've heard a lot of our guests talk about the fact that. Being lonely and isolated is one of their biggest challenges in trying to run and scale their business. CaptainsCouncil.com. 
Go to captainscouncil.com right now and see what we're doing to resolve this problem. We want you to be a strong operator who has solutions and has a way to get around the challenges you're currently facing. What most founders don't understand is that you're not alone. The challenges that you're facing, likely somebody else has already overcome and they can give you the feedback you need to overcome them. Who better than your peers, other founders, other operators who are joining with you in a small group setting, a global community setting, as well as at our in-person events to guide you through these challenges that you're facing right now. Don't give up, keep on pushing, but do it with some good advice from your peers. Go check it out at captainscouncil.com and let me know what you think about the offering. We can't wait to see you there. That's awesome. So really it's been it's been a, a nice journey of building IP that works, yep. accrediting people that can utilize that IP and, and help them grow their own consulting firms. And in return, you're getting you're gaining traction as an IP based product. That's right. Yeah, exactly right, Tom. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Is there a book? There is a book. There is a book. Thanks for mentioning that. It, you know, I forgot that. So we, <laughs> in, in 2014, we actually released a book, which we call the Customer Culture Imperative. And that's really Love it. Um, a book that describes how companies actually change their cultures. How do they actually do it? How do they use the tools that we've developed to do that? Love it. Um, so we've got a lot of really good case studies in there of companies that have been able to do this. And it's not, uh, I'm not going to lie, it's not easy, right? There's, there's work involved yeah. and there's leadership involved. There's it's effort. not easy. Yeah, but um, it's no, doable. I've got a, I've got a brother-in-law that's a culture consultant and I know that it's, uh, I'm very familiar with what you're trying to do. Yep. <laughs> it is not easy, um, especially helping companies understand why they need this. Yep. So how do you do that? What, what yeah. is kind of the, um, yeah. what is the, the demand funnel look like where people are like, oh crap, our yeah. culture sucks. I yeah. mean, what are some trends that people see? You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I mean, look, but I, I think there's a few things. We, we've got two types of clients. We've got clients that have recognized that actually, you know, we were actually getting a lot of negative feedback from customers. Uh, right. And right. actually probably we should do something about that. So, you know, <laughs> so, some companies will say, well, we don't do anything about it. And maybe they're in a, a market yeah. where they can get away with it, right? Um, yeah. But it's those that say, look, we want to do something about it. We actually want to improve. And, and we think that if we do that, we actually can improve the experience. But fundamentally, we can improve the business, right? We can right. be a better business. We can be more successful as an organization, more profitable. Uh, there can be more Love growth it. from that. So. So there's that. So that's the trigger typically. So customers are not happy; they're getting complaints. The other side of it is it. we've got some clients that are actually good businesses, but realise that they want to be great businesses and they want to differentiate yeah. around customer experience. So they really yeah. want to be seen as the market leader in customer experience. And if they want to do that, that's where the tools are really powerful and helpful for them. I love it. I love it. You know, no, nothing is uh, out of the woods. I mean, in terms of clients, that, businesses that are are trying to grow and scale, and, and this is a message to all the listeners, if you're really trying to grow and scale your business, it is so hard to do it when your customers aren't having an amazing experience. I mean, you just need to think about how does that experience work in terms of them referring new clients, them uh, growing their engagement with you. Like there's so many parts of building a positive customer experience that people are generally only focused on client acquisition. Yeah. You know, and, and most of the time they think their growth strategy revolves entirely around more paid ads, more, you know, more commercials, more whatever they need to do to get in front of their, their target avatar. What do you say to people like that? I mean, how do you make them aware that this is a huge portion of their revenue? Yeah, look, I think when we're talking to people that are more financially minded, we need to connect the dots for them around, you know, looking at the customers as, as assets, right? What's the lifetime right. value of the customer? Um, you know, what's a customer worth to the business? And yeah. what, you know, what are the what are the activities that we're doing to ensure that that, that customer assets retained, right, and grown? Right. Um, so right. It, part of it is 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 connecting the, those with a financial mindset to the customer and their activity and how that corresponds to the balance sheet and the, and the profit and loss statement, right? 
So right, uh, right, right. You know, got to be able to show that. Um, that's important, and and there are ways to do that. There's there's great you know uh, methods that we can use to to help them understand that. Some people get it intuitively, sure. but but others need to to be shown black and white. Here are the here are right. the dynamics when it comes to that. Um, and I, I, I think it. you're right, right? You know, most companies are focused on acquisition, and that's expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas retention's you know where the gold is, right? If you can retain totally. a client and work with that client over time, that's you know a very valuable thing for you and your business. Hundred percent. So so we've talked a lot about your growth journey through accreditation. Yep. Um, you know, and, and how you've been able to to get those referrals coming in from these partners and how you've been able to help nurture and grow them. How has uh what are some negative aspects of that? Is there is there a challenge that you didn't anticipate in growing into that model and and how did you overcome that? Yeah, look, I think yeah, one of the challenges is that it's pretty labor intensive in terms of, you know, workshops and 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 bringing people up to speed. And so yeah. that's certainly been a scale challenge is how do you actually educate and bring people accreditate. up to speed? Yeah, accreditate. Yeah. yeah. Um and so, you know, I, I think one of the ways that we've done that and part of, you know, the you know, the covid sort of forcing function if you like was everything went digital. Yeah. And so we went yeah. from, you know, face-to-face -face workshops that were very expensive to yeah. lower cost online digital accreditation programs. And so right. that, that allowed us to, to really make sure that we were providing the level of accreditation we need to, but do it in a more cost-effective way and, and with more access sure. also to, to people. Uh, sure. and, and also, you know, to be able to scale that more effectively as well. So, in some ways, yeah. that that enabled us to to scale a little bit more effectively, uh, you know, leveraging technology. I would think so. Yeah. I would think yeah. so. And where did you where did you gain that balance though between because obviously you're working with people and, yes. and they're your customers in a sense. People like people interactions. Yeah. Do you balance that now that COVID is over? How do you kind of blend the two models of virtual training versus? Uh, doing these in-person uh, meetups and, and accreditation programs? Yeah, it's a tough one to, to, to really figure out. I think there's definitely, you know, a, a strong need for people to come back together in person. We've seen a lot of yeah. lot more demand for that now. Certainly here, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm down in Sydney at the moment, but certainly in the US as well, we've seen that. Um, right. And so, yeah, it, it's a tricky balance because um, that is, you know, we've become used to being able to scale with technology and to lower cost option, but I think you've got to provide both options, right, for people uh, right. And, and let them choose uh, what's the right Very thing cool. for them. Very cool. I love it. Now, this has been fascinating. I, I think that you bring such a, an interesting element to a growth journey for clients because your whole, your whole objective is to help people grow and scale through client uh, satisfaction and, and building within that. And at the same time, you're trying to develop your own growth and scaling program. How hard has it been for you to kind of apply your IP to your business model? Yeah, so I think um, it's a that's a great question. I think that the you know the real challenge for us has been generating more and more awareness for what we do. I think you kind of hit on that yeah. earlier, right? The need's not a recognised need necessarily. Like everyone goes, right. oh yeah, that. Yeah, that's obvious. We need to be customer centric, <laughs> right? Um, right. And so, um, you know, part of our challenge is communicating the need and, and the fact that there is value in taking the time to do this. Uh, and so right. that's been a big challenge because we've we've had to create awareness in the market for kind of like an unmet need, right? Um, or an, right, un, right, you know, right. an unrecognized one. Unrecognized, but, yeah. It's yeah. like, do, do we do we take our leadership team to Mexico this year, or do we? Work on customer centricity. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, exactly right. Exactly right. So I think that's been the biggest challenge for us is how do we overcome that? And that's through, I mean, the way that we overcome it is just through having conversations like this, but having, you know, awesome. writing, publishing, uh, doing those things, trying to get the word out there around what we do and, and how it can add value and I help, love it. help people. I love it. Love it. 
Well, what what have you found in terms of, you know, as you've kind of built and grown this business and and I mean, you've been doing this obviously for almost 20 years now. How has that journey um are there people that you've met either clients or or just people in your network who have kind of become mentors and leaders to you that that kind of kept you focused on the on the end goal? Yeah, look I I I've been fortunate. I mean, I think that that um I've had a lot of great help over the years from people in right. different industries in different um completely different worlds and I think that that helps to it helps your own learning around different ways of approaching the market and different ways of doing things. Right. Um, right. You know, I think that particularly um, the last six years or so, we brought in a new partner to the business that is that has a sales background specifically. Awesome. Um, so awesome. I'll call him Smart. Sean. Yeah. And and he um, <laughs> he lives and breathes this and has done in the organization he worked in. So he was one of those very rare salespeople that really yeah. does um, take the customer on a complete journey from, you know, uh, meeting their need to then making sure that they're getting value right through right. Out the life of the journey of that customer with, with the company. Right. And that's a very rare thing, uh, but we've, we've managed it to, you know, to, to, to have someone join the team that's part of, that, that takes that approach, lives it, breathes it, um, really manifests it, um, and, and that helps us, you know, keep focused as well. It keeps me energized. It keeps the rest of the team energized. So I think you know people. Well, can that's have a, a smart impact. acquisition. <laughs> yeah, I'm very fortunate. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really great to find people like that. And you know, you know, as, as you look out and, and as you think about over the past twenty years, clients that you've worked with, and, and I think a lot of people listening to this podcast may be in the same boat, but how did they identify the need to work with someone like you? I, I talk a lot about on the show the need to, to reach out to third-party people who are standing outside their organization who can kind of look in and say, dude, that's going to hurt you. Or, or, hey, did you realize you could save a lot of money by doing this? Or revenue could go up here. What do you see as the biggest red flags over the last 20 years that you say, that guy, that company is definitely going to buy our services. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think that the, the the leaders that we generally work with are open-minded leaders. So they're people that are sort of, you know, they're looking for ways to improve all the time. So they're, they're you know, they're, they're sort of learning oriented. So they're looking outside. Yeah. They're, they're saying, you know, that there's got to be another way to do this. This, I mean, this is working totally. well, but there's a way to improve it even further, and um, there's a way to kind of navigate this. So they're totally yeah. So they're learning orientated. They're open. Um, they're looking really for for new ways to improve all the time. And so those types of people are the people that we work really well with. Awesome. And I'm assuming you've got on your website uh, a list of your accredited partners who who people can look for in their own geographic area. Yes. Yep. We've got that and a list of clients and different people we've worked with. We've, we've been fortunate enough the last several months to be working with Harvard. So Harvard have um, invited nice. us into to some of the programs that they're running with their clients and working with them. Cool. So that's a, a new exciting opportunity for us. Uh, that's so, huge. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. So that's... Well, that's, hey... This is awesome. Honestly, this has been awesome. I love this type of conversation because I love I love when people like you have the skill sets, you have the IP, you have a process and a way to help companies overcome this challenge. And if you're listening to the show thinking, crap, how do I evaluate whether my clients are having a good experience or not? That is a huge, huge deal. Obviously, you can do secret buyer stuff and you can do different experiences like that, but are you really getting a full picture and I think that your assessment is the key to helping them understand what is going on and how they can move forward. So honestly, Chris, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. Honestly, Chris Brown, Dr. Chris Brown, he is an amazing man. I love, love, love the fact that he's been doing this for 20 years, 20 years helping people develop their market culture and helping them understand what they need to be doing better 
to have better customer experiences and ultimately convert those customers into more revenue. Huge, huge part of business growth, huge, huge part of your scaling program. If you aren't considering ways to improve that experience, you need to be thinking about it. It has to be a part of your business model, it has to be a part of your growth strategy because you've already got them. They're already paying you for goods and services. Don't lose them. Don't lose them. <laughs> and that's my final advice on this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy our other episodes. If you like this one, go take a look at some others. We've got fantastic guests all the time who are constantly giving us feedback and constantly giving us the advice that they did, the decisions that they made to grow and scale their business, which likely will translate to something effective for you. So enjoy the episodes and enjoy our community. We love having people join our community. We have all sorts of ways to interact with us. So figure it out in the show notes below. We have sponsorship tags all over the place, but Captain's Council, I just gotta tell you, if you've ever needed a peer network, people you can bounce ideas off of, people that are founders like you or, or operators like you, it is a lonely place being a business operator. It is hard to validate your own ideas off of yourself because you think all of them are great. Best to have a set network of peers who can listen to you, who can give you feedback and tell you ways they think you might be able to grow your business better, stronger, faster. That's what we all want. So check it out, captainscouncil.com. It will change your life and change the trajectory of your business. Thanks for being a part of the podcast and we hope to see you in either place after this episode. We'll see you then.